Hello and welcome to Don't Bury the Lead. We come to you every Friday night after WWE SmackDown. My name is John Zendel. This is Dom Scarcella. Dom, go ahead and tell the people a little bit about yourself. We are eight days away from Fastlane and this premium live event is finally taking shape here. So without further ado, John, don't bury the lead. What's our top story from the September 29th episode of SmackDown? Dom, we don't ever bury the lead. And we're talking about the main event tonight during the contract signing. L.A. Knight teams with John Cena to sign the contract. And he will be at Fastlane against the Bloodline. Um, the crowd went completely crazy when L.A. Knight came out. And the crowd was really hot for John Cena. Yep. What did you think about this main event contract signing? Exactly 52 weeks ago, you and I sat in these chairs and recapped SmackDown for the first time. For the first time, I said to you, don't bury the lead. And for the first time, you went and dove into the main event of the WWE SmackDown show. And on that show, Max Dupree said he was done being Max Dupree. Well, exactly 52 weeks later, it looks like the former Max Dupree. Is he headlining a premium live event? L.A. Knight and John Cena. What a climb. It's it's our story. Don't bury the lead. It's L.A. Knight's story. We're overlapping completely here. I'm excited for how far L.A. Knight has come in 52 weeks. Uh, I'm glad WWE gave him a chance. Uh, so that, that's all the good feelings about this. Um, I am also pretty impressed at how WWE kept it quiet because he was supposed to be there on last week's show LA night to come out with John Cena but he was sent home the day of Smackdown for testing positive for COVID this week I didn't see any reports at all that LA night was cleared that he was in Sacramento anything at all no mention of him not a whiff throughout the entire show we're down to like 9.55 or whatever on the East Coast here, and L.A. Knight's music hits. Yeah. He's there. Yeah. Yeah, he came out, and he didn't say a word. It was just fisticuffs, physicality in the ring, taking out Solo and Jim Uso. He's not Jimmy anymore, apparently. And then Cena, who had been laid out on the announce table, ready for a Solo Sokoa splash. Rolls back into the ring. The two of them stand tall without saying a word, without grabbing a mic. L.A. Knight looks around, picks up the contract that is in its case lying on the mat there, opens it up, signs it, hands it back to Cena. Two great promos don't have to say a word. What did you think of tonight's final segment that went off the air? I'm not going to lie. When I heard the scene of music and I saw what it was lining up to be, I thought, man, we're going to do, oh man, we're doing, we're, we're back to Cena. He's, he's super stale. It's going to be, you know, the big Cena show now, and it's just going to be boring. And the crowd freaked out when the music hit. So <laughs> I just can't hate on people loving it. I mean, People freaked out when he came out, and he came out and he did the Hulk Hogan, you know, eat your vitamins, say your prayer style promo. And he's like, Captain America, he's saluting people. He's got the jean shorts and the curled up hat. And it's it's so hokey, but it really worked. And tonight I was like, yeah, this is pretty sweet. And then to, you know, kind of circle back to what you said, this is really awesome that – one year ago, we were talking about L.A. Knight, and we're like, this is the best guy on the show. And he's been kind of almost like middling, bottom, bottom tier, mid-tier. He had that pretty bad series of rivalries and storylines, and he's exploded, and he's mm -hmm. the biggest star without question. I would say 
he gets the biggest pop of anybody in the company when he comes out. He's like the rock. He's the top guy, you know. Is is he ready for what looks like the main event of a premium live event? Oh, for sure. Okay. He's been ready for a while. Um, he he's got all uh, he's got everything you would really want. Um, and he's you know he's at the ripe age of like forty one or forty years old where he's yeah, actually right. tried. Um, he's younger than Cena. But you see some of the stuff with TNA and what he was doing there. It's like, oh yeah, they. Why didn't they just keep doing that? You know, he was he was brilliant in TNA. So Billy Corgan has said that had Sean Ricker stayed with NWA, he was probably the strongest possibility to succeed Nick Aldis as NWA champ. Oh. Like they saw it too, but in 2021, I think that's when Sean Ricker signed with WWE left Eli Drake in the rear view mirror. They kind of figured out what to do with him. He was Max Dupree with the Maximum Male Models for a while. And uh, September 30th, 2022, you and I are setting up to do Don't Bury the Lead. And there's this guy on the screen with male models suddenly saying he's done with it. And you and I get on to do our live stream. And I say, I know that guy. <laughs> That's Eli Drake. He's pretty good. I wonder if they're going to let him do anything. <laughs> <laughs> that was the guy you knew, and I had no idea who he was. And you're like, no, he's pretty good. And I was like, all right, well, we'll see what happens. And then it was like, no, he really is pretty damn good. So um, kudos to LA Knight for, for climbing to the top of the mountain here and uh, up, upstaging everyone at all times during SmackDown and, and, being a big, and becoming the star that he is today. Um, and Let's talk yeah. serendipity for a minute. This was sure. not how WWE planned it. Mm -hmm. This was supposed to be revealed last week. Did it somehow work out to be even better that they did just the beat down last week and then had Cena come out like he was going to have to fight them in a handicap match and then have the surprise reveal of LA? Is, did it actually come up roses for WWE that? You know, they had to call an audible and it wound up like this. Could be a happy accident, right? Yeah. Where you have a situation where LA Knight, for the reaction they got tonight, I don't know that you can get a better reaction, especially uh, for the crowd and, and what they were fed all night for the rest of the, like the first hour of the show was not good. So... <laughs> And I think they, they got a I think this was even better for the crowd because they, we got to see one more week of Jim Uso and Solo Sokoa going around backstage beating up people and saying that guy's not going to be seen as partner. As if anybody thought that poor Ashante uh, Viadonis was going to be John Cena's partner. Um, <laughs> it's yeah. good that he survived the talent cuts and he and B Fab are, are still the surviving members of Hit Row, but I, I wasn't at all thinking that he was going to be the partner, nor the random road crew people that they also beat up. But still, I, I think we got an extra week of, you know, the, the these two bloodline thugs just trying to assert themselves backstage. I think this worked. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think this was, this was better than what they were going to do last week. And kudos to them for calling an audible and making it even better than what they, they were initially going to do. I think this worked out very well as a, as a two week storyline. Yeah, for sure. Well, Dom, that's the lead. Anything else you want to talk about with the main event and the lead here? No, we've talked longer than they actually went on TV at this point. <laughs> well, you know, that's the lead, folks. And we're going to go to our next segment here, The Follow, where we talk about the rest of WWE SmackDown tonight. Um. We got a lot of follow here because that last segment was it was eight minutes. Oh yeah, there was no commercial break. I mean that 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 main event talking segment that was that was quick. We we had a, a long show. Besides that, Any where do you want to go? Well, yeah, I I can uh, maybe I'll talk about the best part of the night was the match of the night was uh, Rey Mysterio versus Santos Escobar in what I thought was a great match. Okay. Um. Rey Mysterio goes over. It's babyface versus babyface. Great transitions in and out of, of the ring. And really uh, just a solid, good good old pro wrestling between two LWO members. 
Uh, Rey Mysterio goes over, continues to be the U.S. champ. Dom, what did you think of this match? This is two weeks in a row that they've given us a long match that starts before 9 p.m. where we, we watch SmackDown 8 to 10 on the East Coast here. Um, so several minutes before 9 o'clock, a match starts, and then it becomes a very long match with two commercial breaks. Tonight's match goes 20 to 21 minutes, Bell, at just about 8.53. And it was 9.13 when Santos Escobar went for the phantom driver, but Ray rolls him up for the pinfall. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, post-match, it becomes another fast lane angle. You know, as, as they're maybe going to shake hands and patch things up, the Street Profits come out, jump them from behind, just a total ambush. Bobby Lashley comes out and loves it, so maybe they've patched things up. The rest of the LWO is out. You know, Joaquin Wilde and Cruz del Toro, they get beaten down. And then eventually we see backstage, Ray says the LWO is going to challenge Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits at Fastlane. So this was, this was like you said, this is the best match of the night. And they, they led it very quickly to something for Fastlane, which they have to do because these pay-per-views, premium live events, they, they come at you so quickly. It's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. a month apart for some time of the year. So they, they got to move quickly. I think they did. Um, you like this match a lot, probably more than I did. Um, I will at the beginning I wrote down Matt wrestling early, but not nearly as good as Oscar EO Sky. You know, I this um, took a while to get going. Get, but when it did, it was a good finish. It was a good last five to ten minutes, but it, it was a while here. I think you like the match better though. Go ahead. I really like the Matt wrestling because up to that point, and maybe this is foreshadowing, I thought the show was a complete clunker. Uh there were so many bad segments, and the crowd went crazy. When the guys were Matt wrestling, and they weren't Matt wrestling particularly well, but it was almost yeah. like, and you know, the crowd was bored because at the 50 minute mark, they are going nuts for what is like, you know, sit outs and hip outs and like kind of like doing like some amateur wrestling switches. And yep. the crowd is cheering. I don't know how much of that's sarcastic, but <laughs> it's been a complete clunker to that, to this point with, with all the, it's just a couple bad segments. So I kind of might have liked it a little bit more because I was like, oh, cool. Like, I'm, I can watch some, like, regular wrestling here, even if it's boring and slow. Um, I, some sequences that you like. Because we, we had 20 minutes of wrestling, two commercial breaks, but we saw a lot of TV wrestling from this match. Yeah, I mean, I love the surfboard stretch, which is essentially, you know, it's kind of like the outsider's edge you would set them up for. but. Mm -hmm that's like a hold to the surfboard stretch. And then in addition to that, the reverse torture rack was really cool. Yes. Um, rather than just the regular torture rack reverse. And it looks way nastier when Escobar has Mysterio up like that. Um, so this yeah, they were playing that Ray had a, a bad back just so we could we got to throw some names in here. So it was Santos doing these submission moves on Ray. Yeah. He did this, that surfboard board move where the feeder, hooked on the thighs and then he's hooking the arms and doing the stretch and the announced team is playing up that all oh, that, that really hurts the back there. And so Santos keeps going for the back. Yeah. The torture rack was a cool one. Then he drops down with it and for the extra shock value. So yeah. yeah. So Santos was es Escobar was trying to execute a lot of these submission moves on Ray. And Escobar is kind of working a little bit more heel and, and because they're both big time yeah. baby faces but he's doing the whole, like he does the reverse torture rack. Like faces don't do the, the torture rack to a little guy. And they're and he's really getting stretched out. And every time Mysterio takes a bump or he gets stretched, you're just like, I don't know when the last one's going to happen, right? Because he has been wrestling for so long. Uh, you're an instant heel if you're facing Rey Mysterio, right? Yeah. He's beloved. So yeah. uh, You're picking on the little guy. Everybody loves him and he's little. Like, yeah. how can you possibly be cheered picking on Rey Mysterio? Yeah, he's always got the Mighty Mouse thing going for him. Yeah. But um, I thought, you know, also the crowd was really reacting to it, which is always, you know, I know this is sort of a staple of mine. We've been doing it for a year, and I'm just going to keep repeating my principles. But, like, if the crowd's reacting to it, that's really what you want out of pro wrestling. At the end of the day, it is scripted theatrical performance. So the crowd has to be interested, and that really adds the huge element to it at the end of the day 
I have to say they were doing the LWO chant uh, during the match, and they're mm-hmm. both in the LWO, which shows it still has some legs here, the LWO. Yep. And um, yeah, so I think it's the match of the night. I thought highly of it, and you know, I really like at the end the street profits coming in and mm-hmm. breaking things up, and now the street profits are officially heel. They're finally. I was concerned last week, and I, I mentioned this on the show to you that I didn't know how they were going to get out of this match. I mean, what do you do? Is it did the LWO break up here? Or they, I mean, these two guys shake hands, wrestle a, a tough match for a title, and then hug at the end. What happens? And I think the as Santos and Ray were like trying to patch things up after the match, having the Street Profits come in kind of gets them out of that conundrum. And it also sets up that, hey, I mean, the, the LWO, now they've got a common enemy. Maybe they maybe they managed to have the Ray-Santos match without either one of them turning. And maybe it, it makes the LWO a little bit stronger. And, and the LWO had been dropping down, 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 down the, the rush. Right? They, they were now low card. I mean, Ray wasn't because he had a belt. But the LWO as a whole was low card. Now it looks like they've got a pretty good match on a premium live event. Yeah. Well, Dom... Um... Let's keep the ball rolling here. That's my match of the night. Anything you want to talk about specifically here? Um, the only other really good match we got tonight, and it wasn't even that long. I think maybe they were cutting up against uh, time, was uh, Charlotte Flair and Bailey. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they went seven pretty good minutes. Um, pre-match, Charlotte grabbed a microphone and said, Bailey is a stepping stone. And that she's going to win this match and then challenge EO Sky at Fastlane for the WWE Women's Championship. And then they have a, a pretty good, only seven minutes though, but a pretty good match. Charlotte winds up winning it. Um, afterwards, post match, Bailey grabs a mic and says, uh, "They're going to, they're going to end Charlotte right now. They're going to finish her off." And da- all of damage control, because uh, EO and uh, Dakota Kai are out there in Bailey's corner, they surround the ring and Asuka's music hits. And then in a night full of planned comedy, this wound up being my funniest moment of the night. Asuka comes out for the save, grabs the microphone, cuts a promo entirely in what I'm guessing was Japanese. <laughs> yes. Bailey grabs a mic, acts like she understands Japanese, and says, oh, is that what you want? A triple threat title match at Fastlane? Well, you got it. It's you and Charlotte Flair versus EO Sky for the title. And there's EO looking at her going, that's not what she said. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, That was a great little uh, swerve, if you will, that Bailey thought she was speaking, she knew how to speak Japanese and agreed to the triple threat. And yes. put her, you know, stable mate at risk to lose the title on the triple threat. Right. Um, yeah, that was a, and it was a solid, nice little five to seven minute match that kind of yep. forward the storyline. And again, the women of SmackDown are awesome. I don't, you know, I, they continue to just always put themselves in pretty good positions with the segments and they're mm-hmm. all strong. So, um, this was entertaining. I mean, this was, this was, this was more fun for me than the, the U S championship matches because that one I think went a little long and there were some times in there I went, okay, they're taking too long to set up a move. Like, you know, it, it, they're killing the pacing. They, they tried that with something on the top rope that wound up being a, um, a sunset flip hurricane Rana. It's like, this is taking way too long. There's no way Santos just sits there forever. So I, I I actually like this seven minute match with the women just because they it, I they, they didn't have time to do anything screwy. They yeah. just went out and gave you seven good minutes. And I'll tell you what, the thing with uh Bailey and Charlotte is they're such veterans. The crowd was a little bit dead, and Bailey just starts screaming at the crowd and they start yep. screaming back at her, and then you get a little momentum. Yep. She just knows how to do the cheap stuff. They're uh, pros. Yeah. Absolutely, Charlotte Flair and and Bailey are pros. In fact, Charlotte even said it at the beginning. You know, they, they were two of the the four horsewomen of NXT ten years ago, and now, like, I'm still the measuring stick. You're a stepping stone. So yeah, they, these are two fantastic performers. I I was not surprised. I mean, if they had a little more time on the show, I think this could have been a better match, just because they can each obviously go longer than this. 
Yeah, but and that's a good for point, seven minutes for the story they told for Asuka coming out and looking great. And even though I can't understand a word she says when she speaks Japanese, like I get it, she's animated. I, I get it. I kind of get what she's saying. Although I, I also don't think she was asking for a triple threat. I don't. I, mean, I, I have to check in with Bailey. She speaks better Japanese than I do. <laughs> no, it was a great wrinkle. Um, <laughs> so I guess moving on here, uh, the other match of the night, I would say we could either go with uh, Jimmy Uso in the opener against Machine. Or what's his name? Carl. It was Carl Anderson. Anderson from the OC, right? Yeah, that kind of set up. It's very random because he hasn't been around for months. No. They, they sent him out and Carl Anderson versus Jimmy Uso. What'd you think of that match, Dom? Uh, it served its purpose, which was, you know, Carl Anderson was there at the ambulance last week when they, they took AJ Styles away. And he had been saying, I told him not to get involved in bloodline business. I told him not to get involved in bloodline business. So tonight it's an opening segment with, uh, Paul Heyman, Solo Sokoa, and Jim Uso. He's been he's been very careful to call himself Jim now. So like uh, rebranding, rebranding is Jim Uso. Like Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Hillbilly Jim and Jumpin' Jim Brunzel. We have another Jim in the WWF WWE lineage here. Mm -hmm. It's Jim Uso, and he grabs the mic from uh, from uh, Paul Heyman. And he's mad, and this has to end, and Carl Anderson ambushes him. And so that that works. Carl Anderson clears the ring of, of Jim and Solo, and Paul Heyman just gets out of town on his own. And uh, you could see Carl Anderson saying, like, now it's OC business. So he's there fighting for his friend AJ. So I, I get it. I get that, you know, the AJ Styles thing was a big deal, so here comes Carl Anderson to, to stick up for his friend. They start the match while we're at commercial break. We come back, we get, uh, I think, just three minutes of wrestling. Um, it's over in maybe five minutes. Uh, basically, uh, Jim Uso hits the super kick, then a top turnbuckle splash for the pin at, at 818. So this was not a long match. Now, post-match, Anderson tries to restart the fight. He goes after Jim, and then uh, Solo enters, and that's when Solo spikes him. Um, and then a little bit of funny business as well. This this was kind of a, a good comedy spot. As uh, the Bloodline members are, are making their way to the back, Mission comes out and has a stare down, and Jimmy starts jawing at him, like, yeah, yeah, we took care of him. Mission slaps him right in the face, and, and Jimmy bumps for it. That was good. Well, that was we good. Got, Jimmy bumps for it, and then Solo's like side-eyed him, like, "Really? You got floored by a woman slapping you in the face?" And yeah, so that, that was pretty funny. And that was good. There, there were two kind of good comedy spots live tonight that that I appreciated. Jimmy taking the bump on the Meechin slap, and Solo side eye him, like, "Come on, man! You well, got to stay on your face." <laughs> we got some people here, and we're on Twitch. Hey and there! On Facebook Live, and we don't go live on YouTube, but we've got some people in the chat. So, guys, speak up. Did you watch WWE tonight? This is our one year anniversary. Go ahead and say something about that as we kind of round out here to the follow, which is the entire show of uh, SmackDown we're talking about. Besides the lead, which Besides of course we don't bury here. We did that first. You're going to, if you're just tuning us now, you're going to have to wait for the, the, the show to finish live streaming and catch the lead because we do the most important stuff first on Don't Bury the Lead. That's right. Uh, speaking of important stuff, I think there's a segment that's important to talk about. Sure. And that's uh, Grayson Waller. Um, the Grayson Waller effect. We had the Grayson Waller effect here on SmackDown for what feels like my entire life I've had to watch this garbage. Uh, I wrote D-U-D, dud. The Grayson Waller effect is horrible. What do you think about this segment, Dom? Do you have any sort I, of uh, devil's advocate for him? I think I figured out what the Grayson Waller effect is. Bathroom break. <laughs> Bathroom break. <laughs> That's the Grayson Waller effect. 
Go fix yourself a snack. Take care of business. Come on back. The the uh, fake palm trees will still be there in the ring, and maybe something will happen. Um, this was just – it's like they're burying the Grayson Waller effect here. They have Bobby Lashley come out. Um, Grayson Waller basically kisses up to him. Like, hey, if you're looking for a tag team, uh, A-Town Down Under is undefeated. And Bobby's not buying it. He doesn't want it. And then that brings out the Street Profits trying to make amends with Bobby. Bobby tells him, no, no, you got to prove it. I don't want to hear it. Walks out of the ring on the Street Profits. You know, you got to prove it. Got to prove it. Walks to the back. And uh, that's when Grayson Waller saves a little of face by just uh, announcing Austin Theory, who's coming out for the match next. And neat little stare down at the entranceway between Austin Theory making his way out and Bobby Lashley heading to the back. They have a neat little stare down there. Neither guy backs down. Uh, rekindling something we saw within this year on, on premium live events. Bobby Lashley was in the running for that U.S. title when Austin Theory held it and kept winding up in these you know weird triple threat or quadruple whatever four-way matches and never winning even though he'd always look great in the match, like somehow Austin Theory would retain. So a little, uh, little history there. Maybe that's why Grayson Waller could not convince Bobby Lashley to uh, sign them as, as his new protégés, trying wow. to tell him Austin Theory he's a changed man. He's a changed man. Ah, I'm not buying it. So, eh, yeah. considering we saw – Kind of a squashy match on Carl Anderson. It was high energy, but they kind of squashed them. And then, yeah, they went into this. It was not a good first hour, like you you said. At the end, what, of the what did you think of the match this led into, or do do you I want to talk more about the Grayson Waller effect? Yeah, I mean, the Grayson Waller effect is that I'm like, this is brutal, and it hurts every storyline and match around it. The Grayson <laughs> Waller effect has not helped anything ever i don't know what the point is and i don't get what the ticker is the palm trees the crowds never react to it as well did you notice the ticker did you notice the special thing on the ticker today something about travis kelsey and taylor swift watching the grayson waller effect well i mean listen they're jumping on the memes can i tell you the truth we are all about the views ourselves so sure. i was trying to figure out how I could work Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift into the GP. Of course. I don't race and Waller effect to the rescue, baby. <laughs> yeah. So it did serve a purpose tonight. It got us a chance to do a little pop culture. In. <laughs> but even there's even some other levels to it where they're trying to critique social media and the bottom yes. of it. But they're yes. also the one – they're all the only people that are t- talking about Twitter and X.com and hashtag this and social media that. So, I'm like, you're the ones that do it. Nobody really does that anymore. So, um, ultimately – It's good parody. If at, he were a baby face, there's no way this would fly. It flies because he's a smarmy heel. Yeah. I'm not quite sure it flies, Dom, but – It may not fly. <laughs> it, it may be taxiing along the runway wondering why the flaps aren't going up. I believe this is a dodo. This is the flightless bird. This is the flightless bird. Okay. Um, yeah. So the Grayson Waller effect, I did want to talk about it and I didn't want to bury uh, the whole show too badly because I think a, a lot of it was really good. But we could comment about that on our next segment here. Thumb drive, baby. So thumb drive. You want to give the audience at home and let them know what Thumb Drive is? Thumb Drive is, hey, man, it's it's when you and I distill down everything we've seen on this show into a simple binary. Thumbs up or thumbs down, baby. It's drive time. It's the thumb drive. This is something we added along the way our first year here. We we didn't have such a, a structured show when we started. It was just two guys trying to get back into WWE and, and figure out what is it we're watching. Well, as the months went on, we, we got into sort of a rhythm ourselves. And, and yeah, I think it was for one of the pay-per-views. We just brought out thumbs up, thumbs down and decided, you know, you'd even said, how come we haven't done this sooner? <laughs> you called it on the fly. I will admit you're like, let's do 
it's drive time, thumb drive. And it was like, thumbs up, thumbs down. I was like, oh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> I think he's like, we like that. Fun. It's like, yeah, we should be doing a Cisco Eber. Thumbs yeah, up. right. Is this a thumbs up or a thumbs down? And it's not a, is it like six out of 10? Is it six and a half? Is it three stars out of five? Three? No, it's a thumbs up. This is pass fail. Okay, you're taking this class pass fail here. You know, it's not helping your GPA. It's not hurting your GPA. It's just whether or not you wasted your money on the credits. All right, Dom, let's do it. So three, two, one. Whoa! I gave it a thumbs up. And, and I'm not going to lie. I gave it a thumbs up because I, I liked the comedy stuff. Um, The... Biggest match of the night did get better as it went along. I like that they tried to make sense of fast lane and give us lots of different fast lane stuff to talk about and set some matches for us. And the the, the last segment saved it. I was teetering. The last segment saved it. Yeah. It was beautiful. I mean, they, they only gave themselves eight minutes. Mm -hmm. But it, it worked. It was beautiful. Like the best promo in the company didn't say a word. Like they, they, they successfully kept quiet that LA Knight was cleared to be back and wrestling and was in Sacramento. And when he shows up with two minutes left to clean house, grab the contract, sign it, and hand it back into John Cena's stomach, the crowd goes nuts. And, and it looked like a pay-per-view main event. Watching those four guys in the ring, I said, yeah. And not just because it's, yeah. <laughs> I said, yeah. I could see this being a premium live event, main event. So I like the comedy. I, I like that we got some decent wrestling, although not a lot. And I like that we got a great two-week storyline come to a close there. We've got a main event for the next fast lane. I'll go ahead and, and agree with you. Totally, that there were elements of the show that were pretty good, but for me, and I think I don't want—I want to be clear. I've given like five straight thumbs up, and this is the first time I've given a thumb drive, a thumbs down. But tonight, it was just the Grayson Waller effect and the different storylines before that, and like Carl Anderson randomly showing up and wrestling Jimmy Jim Uso, and. It just was a, it was such a brutal first hour that if well, I had, if I had not had the option, like if I was just casually watching or even didn't have a, you know, don't bury the lead show to talk about this with, I would have turned it off. I would have been like, yeah, I'll, I'll read about it later. So <laughs> for that reason, I'm out. I'm giving it a thumbs down. I think it wasn't like brutal. We've had Smackdowns that were just awful. But mm. this was like very close to teetering on thumbs up or thumbs down. But I'm 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 gonna go ahead and say thumbs down. But we've had shows where I said thumbs up and you said thumbs down. So we have, we have differing opinions. We're not different tastes parroting each other. If there's no leader here, it's like you know we we we're independent thinkers here at Don't Bury the Lead. And so are the people watching us. Tell us, thumbs up or thumbs down for this show as a whole. We don't want your star rating. We don't want something out of 10. It's not a scale. We want it. Like it or dislike it. You, 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 you get one button. You get one emoji button to click here. Yes. And not the like the straight mouth thing. You can go the smile. You can do the frown. You can do the <laughs> thumbs up, the thumbs down. You could do the laugh. You could do the, the angry. You don't, you don't get anything in the middle here on the thumb drive. Yeah. Make a decision. Make be decisive. The and road is full of dead squirrels that could not make a decision. <laughs> this is true. You um, and I made a decision. I'm glad. This, this is, was a good thumb drive. I liked it. Yeah. So yeah, we really grabbed the brass ring here. So uh, you know, speaking of making a decision, I'm gonna decide to move on to our next segment here. So I'll go ahead and explain to the people what this is. We're doing cheap heat. We talk about trending topics around the WWE universe and really pro wrestling in general. Things that could be relevant that we're going to talk about. 
We'll turn them into short videos. We turn them into shorts. We put them on the YouTube. And the YouTube channel has been pretty good of late, like the last two months. Yeah. Um, Thank we're you all. We're nearing 120,000 views in one year. We have 270 subscribers. We started with zero. And we've got a couple thousand view videos out there. We've got a bunch of shorts that have got over 10,000 views. So, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And without further ado, Tom, let me know whenever you are ready to share your I'm ready for some cheap heat here. I'm going to share a screen here. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Let's allow that one. I've, I've got one up here, and it uh, it has to do with what we were talking about in the lead between last week and this week. Um, when L.A. Knight was pulled from last Friday's SmackDown, he was also pulled from the Saturday show, the weekend events. The WWE offered refunds to ticket purchasers from those live events because L.A. Knight was, was advertising, couldn't be there. Uh, this is uh, and, and this story got on to more than the wrestling uh, media. This is on the MSN network here. Um, it, it was all over the place. WWE offered refunds after LA Knight was pulled from live events. And uh, you know, they, they mentioned they only do this. Uh, they were quoting uh, Dave Meltzer here. Meltzer um, from F4W online. Meltzer stated WWE only announce a no-show if it's a top star, which tells you how highly Knight is viewed within the promotion. Like, this is big news for LA Knight. Um, unfortunate for the people who wanted to see him wrestle. Uh, but this just shows you, finally, it looks like the WWE is behind him and they recognize that their fan base is behind him as well. Uh, this is uh, this is sort of the business of wrestling and, and wrestling getting together here. Um, I know I sent this story to you. Were you surprised that the WWE does this kind of stuff? It's not like they had to cancel the show. It was just one guy who couldn't make it. It's crazy, honestly. And, and just knowing how money grubbing they happen to be, like pretty much every private entity, like they're trying to get as much money as possible. And I think it's probably a good bit of goodwill that they probably weren't making a ton of money on a, a, a live dark show and they just refunded the people. Um, so yeah, kudos to WWE. I know they get trashed all the time and Vince is evil and he's horrible, but. I did not see anything here about how many people took them up on the refund offer, just that they offered it. Mm. So I, I We don't know that anybody said, yeah, this, this was such a terrible show. I want my money back or I'm not going now. But the fact that the WWE would publicly offer a refund because LA Knight's there, it, it's just a, a boost to LA Knight. It has to be. This is a shoot and a work, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's part of yeah, it's a shoot and a work for sure. Yeah. And that's our favorite when it when it, it when it's it, a shoot it, and a work. When it trickles into both, that's that's wrestling, baby. It's both. Um, <laughs> Something that they put onto the show tonight. Uh, that we didn't mention because it was just a, a small video. Jade Cargill sides with the WWE from AEW. She had a great run in AEW. She is the first superstar they've signed since the merger with uh, Endeavor with uh, UFC to form the new TKO Holdings. Um, and again, this is more than than just the, the typical wrestling only media. Jade Cargill's given an interview on ESPN, mm -hmm. in which she says she's a. Uh, she knows that, that you know what an honor it is to be the first person signed since the the TKO Holdings emergence. There, uh, this is going to be great tonight. They do a video package for her. Are you surprised that they announced her as Jade Cargill? They're not yeah. changing her name, apparently. Like I could see why they wouldn't do it for Cody Rhodes because he was already Cody Rhodes his first time in the WWE. This performer, this this person has never been in the WWE. She's been a star on another promotion. They're bringing her in under the same name? That's not typical WWE stuff, is it? Yeah, I mean, she basically is Goldberg, or was at least billed like Goldberg in 
AEW where she wasn't the craziest best worker on the planet by any stretch of the imagination, but mm -hmm. great look, could talk on the mic, uh, kind of had that it factor, if you will. And um, I, I saw, you know, I saw a message by Kenny Omega here that said, you know, this may be news to a lot of fans out there, but when one wrestler goes from one company to another, we tend to always wish them the best and cheer for them while they embark on their new journey, journey genuinely. It's embarrassing and shameful, shameful that some fans aren't capable of the same. So basically what Kenny Omega is saying is, all right, don't destroy her because she's going from AEW to WWE. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really interesting perspective that he brings up where I've noticed that like, if we post a video about AEW, then like people are just in the comments about WWE being better. Or we post a video about WWE, they're in the comments about AEW being better. This okay. is probably just an opportunity for Jay Cargill to kind of expand her horizon, go to WWE. Maybe it's a better fit. She has new opponents, new opportunities. And maybe one day, a great example is like Sasha Banks. She's going to mm -hmm. go to AEW and she'll rip it up there. So there's two competitors, but you kind of hope that both do well as a fan and quite frankly, as people that make content. Um, sure, sure. Now, let, let's get into the, the make content. They've already been floating, already been floating possible opponents for her. Um, because she's a, a college athlete, uh, they've, they've floated Jade Cargill versus Bianca Belair. Um, Cargill is also a, a taller wrestler. Uh, she's 5'10". Uh, to put that in perspective, Rhea Ripley, I think, is billed at 5'8". Raquel Rodriguez is billed at 6 feet tall. So Cargill, physically, specimen-wise, she's probably somewhere within the size-wise as well. Rhea to Raquel, she's in there. Um, if you're familiar with NWA, she's, a, she's about the same height and build as Camille, who was also a great college athlete. Uh, so who would you like to see Jay Cargill feud with when she gets into the WWE? Do you have a specific brand you'd like her to be on? They're floating on. They don't know whether she's going to even uh, the developmental brand NXT, although I can't imagine she's going to NXT. Considering, um, considering they hired her, uh, and I think they probably threw a bag at her, I really think that's a deal. I think she got paid a lot of money, and because she – left AEW abruptly. I know AEW thought highly of her. And mm -hmm. AEW pays pretty top dollar to, uh, to, to, to wrestlers. So I can only imagine TKO thought, like, let's get a big signing. Let's steal one of their guys. And um, ultimately, I have to say, hopefully she does well. Hopefully she's in SmackDown so we can talk about her. And hopefully she does – she's over on the internet – so we can make videos about her and we get views. So sure. talk, she's also you know, a former fitness model like <laughs> Trish Stratus. Uh, so, the, yeah. So, I mean, she's definitely, she looks like a superhero. And they mentioned that tonight, but she really does look like Storm from X-Men. There's no, <laughs> you know, she looks. Yeah, like, she's muscular build, tall, muscular build. And, and she's got like the silvery hair going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's 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 a uh, she's superstar looks, and definitely. We'll we'll see what she can do in the ring. You've talked about how she really had to grow into the role as kind of a, a Goldberg figure. Um, is she ready as a in ring performer to be in the conversation with Charlotte Flair, Bailey, Oscar, Bianca Belair, Rhea Ripley, maybe even a Raquel Rodriguez or an EO Sky? Is she is she there yet? In ring work, she's there with the look. I'd say at the end of the day, the thumbs up or thumbs down, John. Come on, it's like the thumb drive. I don't want to scale. Okay, no, I have to scale it. Uh, okay, all the, right, fine. I can't, I can't, I can't have an ultimatum here. Okay. Uh, she. Okay, so the women's wrestling in WWE, I feel, is better than the women's wrestling in AEW. Okay. Uh, I'd actually flip that with the men's wrestling. I feel like the AEW men's wrestling is probably a little bit better than the men's wrestling in WWE. Okay. So well, the women's might be the best wrestling of any, if you were going to split them up into four, I think WWE women's wrestling is probably the best right now. And okay. she's entering in with the top dogs. 
and that's EOS guy, Asuka, Charlotte, Bailey. So like she's gonna have to keep up, you know? Mm-hmm. And they and you could see people like, let's say for example, Ronda Rousey. She couldn't keep up and they couldn't guard her for much longer. And you could see that the match has struggled as a result. Yeah. But I think it's probably a good spot for her to fit into. And I think she's wrestled well enough where she could fit in. But Okay. And very good. I'm I'm optimistic about her being there. I haven't seen much of her, but you know, she she's a great athlete in, in her athletic prime. Let let's let's have her do it. And and I, I agree with you that women's wrestling in the WWE has been for me in this first year, that's been the most pleasant surprise is how good the women's wrestling is um in the WWE over this past year. And if she can add to that, it, it's a tall order. But uh, hey, she's 5'10. She should be able to do it, right? Right. <laughs> Little Twitter exchange between her and Bailey. Bailey, hello. I am the Tree of Life here in the WWE. Pleasure to meet you. Please feel free to watch very closely this Friday as I break down that cheating, nosy idiot, Charlotte Flair. Enjoy and welcome. And, of course, Jade uh, writes back the warm welcome from a role model. Heard from my friends, you're the, you're also the one to look out for. So, hey, you know. Social media, even before Jake Cargill steps into the ring, she's already getting into a back and forth. I like it. I like it. I, I like when the hype machine is there, and I like when the wrestlers can do the hype on their own. You know, I, I like it. Let, let's see where it goes. Now, you mentioned, I like this, uh, Kenny Omega talking about how, how when someone leaves for another opportunity, the wrestlers don't um, don't crap all over it. The wrestlers are genuinely happy for each other. Um, Eddie Kingston may have something to say about that. (laughs) Right. He's the new, uh, is he the international champion on AEW? He He just beat Claudio for some belt. It's a Ring of Honor title. Ring of Honor title. Okay. Which AEW, they do a lot of partnering with ROH, right? They bought Ring of Honor. Okay. So we we see a lot of their belts. They're like Samoa Joe has a Ring of Honor belt. Yeah. Even though he's part of AEW. So, I think- so Eddie Kingston is part of that. Um, he goes on to an Ed Free Shows episode, and he starts talking about how he doesn't like how with modern media, wrestlers are so easy to break kayfabe. He wants people, and this was a profanity-laced episode, apparently. <laughs> so I will not repeat all of Eddie Kingston things, but... Um, he says he thinks the business is going backwards. He doesn't mean that it's going backwards in quality like failing. He means he thinks it's going back in time to when kayfabe mattered more. He thinks the fans, maybe they're oversaturated with hearing so much from wrestlers outside of the ring, talking about what a pleasure it is to work with this other guy who they're supposed to hate on screen. And Eddie's talking about how he hates all these people. Like, he's not going to tell you he likes Chris Jericho. No, he hates them. No, I'm not um, going to tell you what a pleasure it is to work with these guys. No, I hate them. I want to get in a fight with them. I hate them. So, Eddie Kingston, what do you think? I believe people are done with it. People don't want to hear us on Twitter bitching and moaning about what's going on backstage. People don't want to know how much fun I had with my opponent that night in the ring. I believe they want to see that, no, we still don't like each other. Does anybody like Eddie Kingston? <laughs> I would say... Eddie Kingston, it's a piece of work. And he I is. watched AEW with my wife. <laughs> and she mentions the thing about Eddie Kingston is that his character feels so real that it she can't really pull for him. It's she she's like, this guy's too trashy and a little too real. And it just there's such a raw level where like it's very believable that she said, I don't think that that's a big deviation from his actual personality. He's just being himself out there. So that's the one thing about Eddie Kingston, and I love what he's saying here, and I a million percent agree that I don't like when they're on weird podcasts and they're talking about who they work with and like what they're like in the back, and it just elements that aren't really necessary that take away from, you know, that character. You know, you could even talk about the 70s and 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 with Robert De Niro, when he would be playing these big roles, he wasn't on talk shows talking about how he was, you know, 
in taxi, taxi and, 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 or if he was in whatever specific movie that he was in, he was kind of in that character all the time. And that really, you know, helped out the, the believability of it. So sorry, I'm kind of ranting here, but I think no, it, go for the rants. Um, I'm going to shoot on you. Are you ready for a shoot? Yeah, shoot on me. A friend I went to high school with. One of his bouncers at the bar where he manages the bouncers in New York. Eddie Kingston. He has told me he's like this. <laughs> Whoa, okay. So we're getting some insight. Your wife is correct. <laughs> it, it is all too real. This is Eddie Kingston. He, like he's he's a hothead. He wants to fight people. You know, and it, uh, wrestlers have said it's easier to get into your character if there's something you're drawing on from your own personality. This seems to be Eddie Kingston's personality. He's a New York City bouncer at heart. <laughs> That's crazy. I mean, it's also a, kind of believable with the way that he shoots the promos and the way that he just talks from the heart. And also the way that he really... Uh, has been dismissed constantly in his career in pro wrestling in general. I mean, he didn't really make it into any sort of big scene until AEW. No. And he's quite talented on the mic and in the ring. So talented on the mic. He doesn't have a pro wrestler look. It's almost no. like, you know, it's almost like everybody became Vince McMahon. It's like, all right, he's gotta, he's gotta work out more, you know, or they all became Vince Russo while he thinks everybody's a fat piece of crap. You know, <laughs> if, if they're not, if they're not Austin Theory looking, you know, they'll use a modern young wrestler. So mm -hmm. some of his look uh, didn't always go over. But, yeah, Eddie Kingston always had the, the tough guy personality. Um, he was a guy who you could believe would, would fight you. You know, he may not always win, but, you know, Eddie Kingston would fight you. <laughs> Eddie, okay, so if you're going to shoot and, and talk about your friend here, did he ever lose any real fights or did, was he fighting? I don't know. I mean, the thing is when you're a bouncer, you typically have the advantage because the guy you're up against is inebriated and not really in control of his, uh, his faculties and all of his limbs. Um, but yeah, I mean, Eddie Kingston, I mean, he had to make ends meet. We've talked about Sean Ricker, LA Knight, all the stuff he did to, you know, just eke out a living for years. So did Eddie Kingston, man. He grew up in New York city. He lived there. That sounds he's, he's, he's a, he was a natural tough guy. He was a bouncer at a bar. That sounds like some real heel behavior to go beat up with some drunk. <laughs> so that is believable. Um, <laughs> sorry. I, I like it. it. Yeah. That's good. And see, we, we brought a little shoot into a cheap heat here. <laughs> All right. And we're talking about a guy who wants to see more, uh, more keeping a kayfabe. So there we go. Sorry, Eddie. <laughs> so, sorry to bust on you there, but uh, we like you. Yeah, uh, Shawn Michaels. Yeah. Shawn Michaels um, said he would welcome CM Punk in WWE NXT if uh, he wanted to come over. Um, was this reporter who apparently asked this this question to get Shawn Michaels to give this answer? Is this reporter trolling? <laughs> is there any way, if the WWE were interested in CM Punk? That they would send him to NXT. Is this just a troll job? And uh, and Shawn Michaels was way too kind at this uh, press conference to actually answer the question. When it comes to it, will we take him on NXT and have him on our television? Are you kidding? Of course I would. I just don't think anybody would let me. Who wouldn't take that kind of star power? Yeah. Are they just trolling Shawn Michaels here? Any 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 kind of was trying to play nice and, and take it. I I have noticed that uh, Shawn Michaels, as he's gotten older and older and older, maybe wiser and wiser, he's been uh, pretty agreeable. So I think that's a good point that the reporter said something. And he's like, yeah, we're pretty open to anything. Like, um, I feel like with a guy like Shawn Michaels, he had some substance abuse issues and was kind of a maniac in the 90s. And it's mm -hmm. cleaned up a lot and, you know, found God and kind of corrected himself in that regard. So maybe I, I think you're probably on to something with the reporter kind of taking, twisting his words and, and asking him like a long winded question, which is trying to pivot him into saying, yeah, I would let's 
I'm signing CM Punk tomorrow, you know? Yep. Uh, Shawn Michaels also says, you know, I understood him. Whether you want to say there are similarities in us, I can't lie. Um, I understand he's a different kind of cat and can sometimes be challenging to get along with people. But that is probably why I like him, because I suffer from the same thing. There you go. So Sean Michael may be sticking up for the uh, the oddballs and the guys who maybe, you know, ruffle some feathers and, and don't get along with everybody. You know, maybe the the Eddie Kingstons of the world who who really do want to fight you. <laughs> right. So that that's what I got for uh, for GP today. Uh, the, this one uh, came to us from Ref WrestleZone as did the Eddie Kingston one. So thank you to WrestleZone for uh, keeping tabs on on some of the behind the scenes news coming to us uh, from Eddie Kingston and from Shawn Michaels. Uh, and of course, ESPN, thank you for uh, the Jade Cargill interview. And lots of people had the WWE issues refund story. I pulled from a mainstream source just to show how mainstream that story had gone but uh yeah cheap heat we scour the internet if i see something that looks interesting i make a note of it save the link send it to you and say cheap heat <laughs> and i say absolutely yeah most of the time you're like yeah we can do that it's, it's very rare where we go nah that's too cheap or it's not quite heat enough <laughs> it's not quite cheap enough for us <laughs> we need it to be really cheap <laughs> here we go that's cheap heat dom great job and uh excellent conversation about eddie kingston sean michaels jay cargill of course he's going to be the big uh you know interesting topic to talk about and we'll make some short videos here we'll probably make a short video tonight about thumb drive and um you know we're kind of i have an important question for you and and people in the comments can answer as well we started Don't Bury the Lead on September 30th, 2022. Tonight is September 29th, 2023. Is this the end of year one? Or is this 52 weeks later, the beginning of year two? How, how do we want to call this year? Because this could be an historic episode of Don't Bury the Lead. Well, it is one way or the other. It's either the end of a successful year one, and I got to say it was a successful year one. I'm, I am delighted with the response we've gotten from people and how the show has just gotten better in quality with you and I bouncing ideas off of each other and, uh, and, and making the best of this. This is more than just, you know, two friends yapping about a wrestling program. This is, a, this is pretty cool. Um, yeah, we, it's a concerted effort for sure. I mean, I think I basically messaged you one night and was like, hey, you want to do this wrestling show? And then you're like, all right. And then we met at a diner. Yeah. We talked about it. And it was funny because the first shows, I don't think we were even close to aligned to what we were going to talk about. Yep. Uh, we didn't, I, I had to figure out how to stream, how to make a YouTube channel. Like all those things were very foreign. And I was like, let's just start making them. And we put it on YouTube live to like a whopping one to two to three viewers. And I think the oh, one which were me. Yes, we would. I would look at returning viewers and the statistics and I would see, oh, it's me and Dom looking at the same video and <laughs> getting seven views are two returning viewers. So uh, <laughs> to kind of get the ball rolling, start to think of new ideas and, you know, reach out to resources on YouTube and essentially see what other people do and start mimicking that. It's been such a fun ride and it's only one year in and we're pretty close to kind of getting, we're kind of snowballing here. So uh, Dom, thanks so much. This has been a lot of fun. And yeah, this, this is our one year anniversary. I didn't even think I don't have any cupcake or candle, um, but. I, I, I asked and, and maybe the, the people watching can help us. Is this the end of year one or the start of year two tonight's show? What do you think? This is true. We maybe it's going to have to be next week where I bring out the cupcake, the candle. We sing happy birthday and uh, we make a wish. OK, so may maybe we'll call this 364 days later. This right now is the end of year one. Next week when we're doing fast lane, aren't we? We are doing fast lane. 
Next week for Fast Lane, we will we will officially announce that it's the beginning of year two. I like it. What what do you guys think? Are we wrong about this? This is like, do you remember uh, the year 2000 and 1999 and people arguing, when is the new millennium? When is the new century? Is it January 1st, 2000 or January 1st, 2001? We're doing the same thing here. They even got a Seinfeld episode out of it. <laughs> you know, Dom, I think about, I think it was roughly 13% of our viewers are under the age of 25. So those people cannot answer that question. But for our people over the age of 25, which is the other, I don't know, 87%, let us know in the comments. Is it, are we one before, after? So. Yeah. Is, is this the start of the new millennium or is it the end of the old millennium? <laughs> right. Hey, it's been one year exactly as of tomorrow of LA night and don't bury the lead. I'm going to keep putting us together there forever. Right. When LA night wins a title at WrestleMania from Roman Reigns, we would have overtaken Jim Cornette, uh, Chris Van Vliet, <laughs> and, uh, Jim Ross, barbecue, whatever show, and all of the other podcasters out there, we would be the number one. I think that's, we're, we're in that, category right now we are sinking with la Knight on his trajectory in wwe this, this has been one don't bury the lead the lead is i've had a great time doing this and uh if we are officially starting year two next week i'm looking forward to year two all right well dom thanks so much for joining this has been a lot of fun tonight it's been a great year it's been a lot of fun obviously you know we, we spoke our piece about it but um at the end of the day SmackDown has been really helpful because it's been pretty good the last year too. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're kind of moseying on down through the Italian goodbye. So Dom, thanks so much for joining everyone out there. Thanks so much for watching and participating with us and have a great rest of your evening. All right. And we are...